Welcome to the Introduction to a SysD webinar. The audio for today's session is available by telephone or audio cast. If you find the audio cast quality, which is subject to equipment bandwidth and internet traffic, is unsatisfactory, please use the telephone dial-in option provided in your confirmation emails. If you do not see the phone number in your email, contact the webinar operator. Operator is assistance is available to those on the telephone by pressing zero pound. You may send your questions or comments at any time by using the Q&A window located on the lower left of the presentation screen. Type your question at the bottom of the Q&A box and click on the Ask button with your mouse to send it. I will now turn the call over to Sharon Purcell. Please begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for the introduction to Oasis D webinar. My name is Sharon Purcell, and I will be your host and moderator today. Before I begin the transition to Kathy and Charlotte, I have a few housekeeping items. This webinar is being recorded. It will later be posted to the CMS Home Health Quality Reporting Program website. We will provide you with details on accessing the recording via an email when it is available. If you would like to use the closed captioning, the closed captioning screen is located at the bottom of the screen. The phone lines will be on mute for the duration of the presentation. Due to the large number of attendees on today's webinar, we are unable to fill questions over the phone. But you are able to submit questions electronically by entering the question at the bottom of the Q&A box in the lower left-hand corner of the screen. Submit by clicking the Ask button. Training materials can be downloaded from the download section of the Home Health Quality Reporting Program training page. The download section is at the bottom of the training web page. If you would like to display the slides in a larger view on your screen, click the title of the PowerPoint presentation and the option for full screen will appear. If you click on full screen, you will change your view only to be in full screen mode. In order to exit full screen, hit the ex escape key on your keyboard in order to return to a normal view. On slide five, please note this presentation is current at this time. However, Medicare policy changes frequently, so we recommend that you check back on the Home Health Quality Reporting Program website periodically for updates. Throughout the presentation, there are specific references to links which might be helpful in getting up-to-date information. Looks like I lost my screen. One moment, please. We should go to slide six for presenters. Thank you. Today's presenters will be Kathy Roby and Charlotte Stinniger. Kathy is a senior consultant from Home Health Care at Qualadyne. She specializes in teaching and educating nurses, focusing on improving home health provider clinical outcomes and reducing acute care hospitalizations for home care patients. To achieve these goals, she, con she conducts on-site audits of home health care agencies, analyzes workflow processes, and makes recommendations for efficient processes resulting in better outcomes for patients. Kathy is a frequent presenter on quality improvement topics in conferences across the country. Kathy holds an MS in Healthcare Administration from the Hartford Graduate Center a Master's in Education from St. Joseph's University, and a BS in Nursing from the University of Connecticut. She is a certified home and hospice care executive and a certified trainer for integrated chronic care management. Charlotte 
is an consultant at Qualidine and has over 18 years of professional experience in the home health care industry as a nurse case manager and clinical educator. Charlotte works directly with home care, home health care agencies, accessing their compliance with state and federal regulations, and providing recommendations to improve clinical processes. She develops training and education on various topics relating to home health best practices and related regulations. Charlotte served as a Director of Staff Development at Interim Healthcare Harford for over 12 years, spearheading num numerous initiatives, including staff education and efficient workflow operations. Charlotte's professional area of pro specialization is in promoting quality enhancements of healthcare systems using technology solutions. She has been a certified OASIS specialist, clinical, since 2006. Charlotte is a registered nurse and holds a B BS in nursing education from the University of, of Hartford. She is also an active member of the CT Association for Healthcare at Home Education at Home Home Education Committee. On slide seven through ten contains a reference list of different acronyms that will be used throughout today's presentation. Today's webinar, Introduction to the OASIS D Information, will provide home health providers with a high level overview of changes to the OASIS D related to home health quality reporting programs. These changes to the OASIS D are scheduled to become effective January 1, 2019. We will conclude the event with a question and answer session and finally a wrap up. Now that an introduction and housekeeping slides have been covered, I'm going to turn the presentation over to the presenters, Kathy Roby and Charlotte Stinniger. Kathy and Charlotte, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kathy Roby, and I'm very happy to be here with you today. I thought a good place to begin would be to identify our learning objectives for our time together this afternoon. First, as Sharon indicated, we're going to begin by describing the Improving Medicare Post-Acute Care Transformation Act of 2014, otherwise known as the IMPACT Act, and the resulting changes that this made to the Outcome and Assessment Information Set, commonly known to the home health world as OASIS. Our second objective is that we are going to identify the major changes that will be occurring be from the OASIS C2 we currently are using to the OASIS D. Third, we are going to identify for you the available resources that you can use for training, educating, and understanding the new OASIS D. Let's talk a little bit about the training opportunities, and there are several. Because this is information that is very important, we're beginning today with the introduction to OASIS D. This program, as Sharon said, is being recorded and will be posted on the CMS website at a date to be determined. The second program on September the 5th will be the introduction to OASIS D, the Section GG. This will go over the Section GG in great detail, and we encourage you to be present for this program. A Q&A teleconference is currently being anticipated to be held at some point in October or November of this year. And finally, there will be an in-person home health provider training to go over the OASIS D changes in person, in detail. This program will be held in Baltimore, Maryland. It is also anticipated to be held sometime in late October or early November of 2018. Training information and updates about when different recordings will be available to you can be found on the Spotlight and Announcements section of the CMS website. 
<clears throat> on your slide, you have a live link under the green banner. This will take you directly to the spotlight and announcements. The purple banner is showing you the live link that will take you directly to the home health quality reporting training. Both of these are important for you to have, and I encourage you to hold on to these links and list them in your favorites. So that having been said, let's take a dive into the overview of OASIS-D and the Impact Act of 2014. As we said in the beginning, we're going to be looking at some of the basic premises of the Impact Act of 2014. Hard to believe that that's already four years ago and that we've been working our way through this process all that time. We're also going to look closely at the changes coming from the OASIS C2 that you use today to the OASIS D. We will identify new items, revised assessment items, and those that are being removed from the tool. We'll discuss the rationale for each of these OASIS changes. So the Impact Act of 2014 it, this was a bipartisan bill that was signed into law by President Obama on o October the 6th of 2014. It stipulates that post-acute care providers will report standardized patient assessment data and use for their quality measure data. The important words to remember here are standardized patient assessment data. So what exactly are we doing here? I realize that this slide is busy and it is small, but I want you to look at it carefully. Post-acute care includes long-term care hospitals, inpatient rehab facilities, home health agencies, and nursing homes. We use so many acronyms, and these were in the list that Sharon shared with you at the beginning of our program. But we need to be familiar with them so that we know what we are referring to. And you can see here that we each use different tools, we have different volumes of beneficiaries, and obviously a wide range of spending in terms of the federal dollars. What was the driver behind the Impact Act coming into being. The purpose was specifically to ultimately improve the beneficiary outcomes for all Medicare beneficiaries, to provide access to what's called longitudinal data so that we can better facilitate coordinated care across the continuum. We want to be able to enable comparable data and quality assessment across the post-acute care settings. We want to improve hospital discharge planning so that as Medicare beneficiaries and ultimately all patients being discharged from hospitals are being referred to and settled into the most appropriate setting for their continued improvement in care. And lastly, the final purpose was research, so that we could look at the data and the quality measures we were gathering and make some conclusions going forward. Why all this attention, all of a sudden, on post-acute care? On the previous slide, there was a brief mention of the costs associated with each of the different settings. These costs are rising. We also did not have standardized data that could transfer in what's called interoperability across the different post-acute care settings. With the ultimate goal of establishing payment rates according to the individual characteristics of the patient, not tied specifically to the care setting, that's why this Impact Act, the goal was to really look at the data and use it to the benefit of all the Medicare beneficiaries. 
We've mentioned standardization. What exactly does this mean? I know when you look at this slide, it looks rather like a slot machine, doesn't it? We have four different fruits popped up on our machine. If we are looking at assessing a specific item in a patient's functional ability, perhaps we are looking at their eating, their ability to actually eat by themselves. If this patient is residing in an inpatient rehabilitation facility, the assessment tool is called the Earth Pie, and it has its own current questions for how they would assess the patient's ability to eat. In a skilled nursing facility, this would be called the MDS, Minimum Data Set. And here, our orange would be the tool we'd be using to assess the patient's ability. In home health, we would have Outcome and Assessment Information Set, OASIS. We'd be using a banana to measure their ability. Lastly, long-term care hospitals use a tool called the Continuity Assessment Record and Evaluation, CARE. They use a strawberry. So we'd have a fruit salad, but we wouldn't have a standardized assessment that would enable us all to be speaking about the same thing in the same way. So that as each setting did its assessment, and tried to speak to one another about what this patient could do, we're speaking Greek and Latin. If we use standardized language, a standardized approach to assessing that particular functional item at the item level, all of a sudden our slot machine came up cherries and we are all speaking the same language and we are all able to communicate that patient's functional level to one another. Doing this, provides us with what we call SPADES, Standardized Patient Assessment Data Elements. This slide shows you another way of looking at what we've just been talking about. You can see that each of the colored bubbles overlaps in some ways, but that's all different colors because we're all different languages. But that space in the center where we all speak the same language these standardized elements are question and response options that are now identical in all four of the post-acute care assessment instruments. They have identical standards and definitions that apply. This move towards standardized assessment data elements makes it easier for us to collect data across the settings, to perform quality measurement, to compare the outcomes, and to have, again, what is called interoperable data exchange. On the CMS YouTube channel, there is a video from the November 2016 Home Health Quality Reporting Program Provider Training. This video from November 16 and 17 prevents and presents an overview of the Impact Act of 2014. There is a link there under the picture if you feel that a review would be beneficial to you. To clarify some of the things we've just been discussing, please go to this link and review this video. Let's take a look at an overview of the OASIS changes that will be effective on January 1, 2019. Let's first address what effective January 1, 2019 means to us. That means that you will use the Moon 90 date to determine when you use the Oasis D as opposed to the prior Oasis C2. So you want to remember that date. The changes include six new items. There are four GG questions, GG0100, GG0110, GG0130, GG0170, there are two J questions, 1800 and 1900. Seven of the existing Moo elements have been revised. 28 have been removed from the OASIS data set as part of cost reduction and re reducing provider burden. 
On the next slide, what you are seeing is a list of the M items where the guidance manual has changed. Again, remember our ultimate purpose is that we should all be speaking the same language. These items have had changes made in the guidance manual in terms of how you are to read, interpret, and answer these particular assessment elements. So we strongly urge you to carefully review each one, review them with your staff, so that you can better inform clinical practice. Let's refresh. Why again is OASIS being changed? The IMPACT Act is focused on standardization of the elements across the different settings of care. That refers to these questions that are new standardized items that will be the same across all of the settings. The two J questions, 1800 and 1900, and the four GG assessments. Cross-setting alignment is to bring specific items into alignment so that we are collecting data for cross-setting measures. This includes drug regimen review, pressure ulcers, active diagnoses, height and weight. These should be familiar to you because these are some of the pieces that we discussed in depth in the C2 transition. Comprehensive item use evaluation. We talked about the fact that the Impact Act also focused on the reduction of the burden on collecting data on the providers. So as part of this goal, quality measure changes were made and it was important that items be aligned with the survey and certification process. Lastly, there were general updates and corrections made as necessary to ensure that all of the information provided to you is accurate and clear. I've mentioned that there are new items in the OASIS D. Section J is titled Health Condition Falls. J1800 refers to any falls that have occurred since SOC ROC, Start of Care, Resumption of Care. J1900 looks at the number of falls since SOC ROC, Start of Care, Resumption of Care. Section GG is looking at specific functional abilities and the goals relative to these abilities. GG0100, this is prior functioning in everyday activities. GG0110 looks at prior device use. GG0130 looks at self-care. And lastly, GG0170 addresses mobility. Both of these are going to be covered in a little more detail as we go through today's presentation. And on September 5th, we will go into these in great detail. How have these new items affected the time point data collection? Section J, J1800 and J1900, these two elements are assessed and data collected at these time points, at transfer, at discharge from the agency not to an inpatient facility, and lastly, death at home. The Section GG items, Functional Abilities and Goals, GG0100, Prior Functioning Everyday Activities, GG0110, Prior Device Use. These two elements are assessed and completed at Start of Care, SOC, and Resumption of Care, ROC. GG0130, Self Care, and GG0170, Mobility. These elements are collected at SOC and ROC as the two previous elements are, but they are also collected at follow-up and discharge from the agency, not to an inpatient facility. If you recall, I mentioned that there were several items in OASIS-D that have been revised 
since their current status in OASIS C2. I'm sure you recall M1028, active diagnoses. This has been revised. M1306, unhealed pressure ulcer or injury at stage two or higher. And M1311, the number of unhealed pressure ulcers or injuries at each stage. M1322 as well, the current number of stage one pressure injuries has also been revised. M1324, the stage of the most problematic unhealed pressure ulcerator injury that is stageable has been adjusted. M2102, the types and sources of assistance available to the patient, as well as M2310, the reason for emergent care, have been adjusted as well. We are going to look at the changes in each of these items in detail, one at a time, in the presentations that will follow. I mentioned to you that certain data elements have been removed from the OASIS. Throughout the course of 2017, CMS undertook a comprehensive review of each and every assessment element. 28 of those OASIS items were identified as being appropriate for removal to reduce the data collection burden that is currently placed on the providers. Why were they removed? What was the basis for selecting those 28 items? They were designated to be removed if they were not used to support current home health Q quality reporting program measures, if they did not support the Home Health Prospective Payment System, PPS, if they were not relevant to the survey process for Medicare certification, if they did not support the Home Health Value-Based Purchasing, VBP, demonstration measures, if they were not a critical risk adjustment factor, or if they were not directly related to the conditions of participation they were identified as being appropriate to be removed. The list is long, and we have a great deal to cover today. So for that reason, I'm not going to go through them one at a time. But these next few slides, identify them for you, one at a time, with their M number, their description, and the X's are in the boxes for what assessment time point they have been deleted. So that's slide 31. It continues on slide 32, 33, and 34. Now that we're on slide 35, we are going to look at these items which were removed from the discharge time point only. It's an important distinction. As you looked at the previous few slides in the teal color, you were able to see that these were being removed from multiple different time points. But these four are being removed from discharge only and will continue to be collected at SOC, ROC, and follow-up. In Oasis D, these items have had portions removed. This is where CMS has looked at M2102, the types and sources of assistance that were available to the patient. On start of care, six of the seven response options have been removed. At resumption of care, six of the seven were removed. On discharge, three of the seven response options were removed. In 2310, the reason for emergent care, at transfer to an inpatient facility, 15 of the 19 response options were removed. At discharge from the agency, 15 of 19 were again removed. I want to call your attention to the asterisks at the bottom of the graph. The single asterisk calls your attention to 2102, start and resumption of care. 2102 row F is going to continue to be collected 
at SOC, ROC, and discharge from the agency because it is part of the Home Health Value-Based Purchasing Program. The two stars in 2102 indicate that rows A, C, and D will remain collected at discharge because they are related to survey purposes. The three stars in, row tw in item 2310 refers to the fact that responses 1, 10, other, and unknown will continue to be collected at transfer to an inpatient facility and discharge from the agency, again, for survey purposes. We are aware that many providers use the current reason for emergent care as an internal use data collection as part of your performance improvement process. You will need to find an alternative method to collect this data if you wish to continue to do so. Items have not only been changed or removed. In some cases, there have been skip patterns that have changed. This is due to those items that were removed. Skip patterns are most often seamless and invisible to those providers who are using electronic medical records. Those who are still operating on paper and then data entering into Haven will need to be more cognizant of these changes to avoid inadvertent errors. Please look closely at this list to see what M numbers and what elements have had a skip pattern change. And so it's time to begin. We've looked at what elements were removed, what were changed, what have had skip patterns changed, and it's time to take a look at the new Section J health conditions. In this section, we are going to begin to describe the new assessment item in Section J health conditions. We will review when the, what time points we will complete this element, what the intent behind it is, how it's defined, and how to code it. And then we're going to take those coding instructions and we're going to practice with some patient scenarios. So well, let's begin with when we're actually going to collect this element. J1800, any falls since start of care, resumption of care, SOC ROC, whichever is more recent. This is completed at the time of a transfer oasis, a discharge not to an inpatient facility, or a death at home. J1900 is the number of falls that have occurred since Sock Rock, whichever is more recent. And this too is collected at transfer, discharge not to an inpatient facility, and death at home. On your screen, you now can see what this new element is going to look like when you see it on the page in front of you. Both of the questions are there together. You have a code box for J1800, and you have a coding scheme for J1900. Let's begin by looking at J1800. Any falls since start or resumption of care whichever is more recent. Here's the top half of the previous slide. J1800, any falls since start or resumption of care, whichever is more recent. When you look at it in front of you, you're going to see you have on the left a code box that says enter code. To the right, it says, has the patient had any falls since Sock Rock, whichever is more recent. You have two choices here, zero for no, at which point you would then skip to J1900 after entering zero in the code box, or yes, in which case you would enter one in the code box and continue to J1900, the number of falls since Sock Rock. The intent behind this question 
is to identify if the patient had any witnessed or unwitnessed falls since the most recent start or resumption of care. How are we defining a fall? Sounds like it would be simple enough, don't you think? But it's actually not. There are some complexities here that we need to consider. The basic definition of a fall is the unintentional change in position coming to rest on the ground, the floor, or onto the next lower surface, as in from a standing position to onto the lower surface of a bed or a chair. The fall may be witnessed or unwitnessed. It could be reported to you by the patient or an observer, or identified by you when the patient is found on the floor or on the ground. And the fall is not a result of an overwhelming external force, such as another person pushing the patient with such force that they do fall. What's an intercepted fall? An intercepted fall occurs when the patient would have fallen if he or she had not caught him or herself or had not been intercepted by another person. An intercepted fall is still considered to be a fall. It's important to remember, however, that there are occasions when a clinician will be challenging a patient's balance. CMS understands that challenging the patient's balance and training him or her to recover from that loss of balance is an intentional therapeutic intervention. This is not considered to be an anticipated loss of balance that occurs when it occurs during a supervised therapeutic intervention. It is not an intercepted fall if a therapist or another clinician is challenging the patient's balance, training them how to recover, self-correct, so as not to fall. And if they do so, this is not considered to be a fall that we would include. In J1800, in order to gather the information, you are going to be able to review the home health clinical record, review incident reports, or other relevant clinical documentation such as fall logs. You would interview the patient and or the caregiver about occurrence of any falls. And this is because the fall that is recorded may be both witnessed or unwitnessed and because data from a third party is acceptable. How will we code this element? As I said before, when we first looked at how it appears on the screen, you're going to code zero or no if the patient has not had any falls since the most recent start or resumption of care. That would mean that in the code box to the left, you would enter zero for no. You would code it yes, number one, if the patient has fallen since their most recent start or resumption of care assessment. You would code the fall no matter where the fall occurred. You would then enter one into the code box to the left. A dash is a valid response for this item. However, given all of the different data sources available to you as a clinician, CMS expects the DASH use to be a rare occurrence. Let's take a look at a practice scenario. Our discharging registered nurse has reviewed the clinical record. She interviews the patient and the caregiver, Mrs. K and her daughter, Susan. She determines that a single fall occurred since the most recent start or resumption of care. The fall is documented on a clinical note from an RN home visit in which Susan reported her mother slipped from her wheelchair to the floor on the previous day. How would you go about coding J1800? Any falls since the most recent 
start or resumption of care. If you are with a group listening to this program today, have a conversation. Think about this. How are you going to answer it? As a zero no or a one yes? Make a note, jot it down for scenario one. How will you code this? as a one or a zero. And our answer appears to be that you would code this as a number one, yes. And you would be doing that because this item addresses both unwitnessed as well as witnessed falls. And we know that the patient's daughter told us in a previous nursing visit that the patient had slipped from her wheelchair and fallen to the floor. So you would enter the number one in the code box to the left saying that yes, one fall occurred. Let's have another scenario and try practicing it a little differently. An incident report describes the event in which Mr. S appeared to slip on a wet spot on the floor during a home health aid box visit. Mr. S lost his balance. He bumped into the wall but he was able to steady himself and remain standing. How will you code J1800 in this situation? Any falls since start or resumption of care. Will you code this as a zero no, or will you code this as a one yes? Again, if you are with a group, discuss it together, jot down your answer. If everyone's ready, let's move on and see what the answer actually was. In this case, the answer was yes. We would enter here the code number one for yes, a fall has occurred since the last sock or rock. The rationale for that is an intercepted fall is still considered a fall. Remember in the scenario, it said the patient stumbled, slipped on the wet floor, but he caught himself, thus it was an intercepted fall, and that is coded as a one. Let's move on to scenario three. A patient is participating in balance retraining activities during a therapy visit. In this case, the therapist is intentionally challenging the patient's balance, anticipating a loss of balance. The patient has a loss of balance to the left due to hemiplegia, and the physical therapist provides minimal assistance to allow the patient to remain standing. How will you code J1800, any fall since sock rock, in this situation? Discuss this together if you are in a group. Make a note of your answer, and if everyone is ready, we're going to move on to the next slide, where we will see that the correct answer here is to code this as zero, no. And why is that? The rationale here is that the patient's balance was being intentionally challenged by the physical therapist. So a loss of balance is anticipated. When assistance is provided to the patient to allow him or her to remain standing during an anticipated loss of balance, as part of a supervised therapeutic intervention. This is not considered a fall or an intercepted fall. Remember the key words here, a supervised therapeutic intervention where the balance is intentionally being challenged. Those are the key words when you are coding a scenario such as this. Now that we've talked about 1800, let's move on to J1900. The number of falls since start or resumption of care, whichever is more recent. On your screen, you will see what the item looks like. Here we have three coding options and three code boxes, three choices for you to look at. You have a choice of option A, no injury, no evidence of any injury is noted on physical assessment by the nurse or primary care clinician, no complaints of pain or injury, no change in the behavior is noted after the fall. B is injury except major. 
described here as skin tears, abrasions, lacerations, superficial bruises, hematomas, and sprains, or any related, fall-related injury that causes the patient to complain of pain. C is a major injury, bone fracture, joint dislocation, closed head injury with altered consciousness, or a subdural hematoma. What is the intent behind this item? Our intention here is to identify the number of falls the patient has had since the most recent sock rock and to code the fall-related injury. What is the definition of an injury related specifically to a fall? This is a documented injury that occurred as a result of or was recognized within a short period of time, i.e. hours to a few days, after the fall occurred, that can be attributed to the fall. The guidance manual does not stipulate a specific time frame for this question, simply stating within a short period of time. So this is requiring you to utilize your appropriate clinical judgment. The response-specific instructions and how you will gather this information. You want to begin by reviewing the clinical record. Look at the incident reports. Any other relevant documentation, such as your agency fall logs. A patient caregiver interview should take place, asking about the occurrence of any falls. I determine the number of falls that have occurred since the most recent start or resumption of care, and then code the level of fall-related injury for each. In your coding, you want to include falls no matter where the fall occurred, but code each fall only one time. If the patient sustains multiple injuries in a single fall, you code the fall for the highest level of injury. Another way to state this would be, if the patient had fallen and sustained some bruises and a fractured arm, then we must code for the higher level of injury and only code one fall. So let's begin by looking at option A, no injury. We're going to code this as zero, none, if the patient has had no injury-causing falls since the most recent start or resumption of care. You would enter one in this box if the patient had one non-injurious fall since the most recent start or resumption of care. Code two for two or more if the patient has had multiple non-injurious falls since the most recent start or resumption of care. Always remembering that A is no injury. You are entering the number of falls, none, one, two, or more, that the patient sustained no evident injury. A dash is a valid, valid response for this item, but again, looking at the variety of different resources for information and assessment CMS does expect that DASH use will be a very rare occurrence. What does no injury mean to us in our assessment? There is no evidence of any injury noted on physical assessment. The patient offers no complaints of pain or injury, and there is no change in the patient's behavior noted after the fall occurred. Let's take a look at J1900B, Injury Except Major. This reads, Injury Except Major, Skin Tears, Abrasions, Lacerations, Superficial Bruises, Hematomas and Sprains, Any Fall-Related Injury That Causes the Patient to Complain of Pain. Here in this box, you will enter zero, none, if the patient had no falls with injury except major, you will enter a one if the patient reports or sustains one fall 
with injury except major. You will enter two, two or more, if the patient has had two or more falls with injury except major since the most start or resumption of care. Remembering, again, that you have the clinical record, interview, assessment, all of these different resources to gather information. So therefore, a dash, while a valid response, should be a rare occurrence. Injury except major, again, is defined as skin tears, abrasions, lacerations, superficial bruises, hematomas, sprains, any fall-related injury that causes the patient to complain of pain. This is not a complete list, but it does give you some good examples of what kinds of injury would fall in this definition. Lastly, let's look at item C, J1900C, major injury. Here we are going to code zero if the patient had no fall with a major injury since the most recent sock rock. You will code one if the patient had one fall with major injury since the most recent sock rock. And finally, you'll code two or more if the patient had multiple falls with major injury since the most recent start or resumption of care. Again, a reminder, the DASH is valid, but CMS expects the DASH use to be a rare occurrence. We've defined a major injury as a bone fracture, a joint dislocation, a closed head injury with altered consciousness, or a subdural hematoma. Again, this is not a complete and exclusive list, but it does give you some guidance and some examples of what a major injury might be. So now it's time to self-test your knowledge. We're going to look at a scenario and how you might code this information. A review of the clinical record, incident reports, and a patient caregiver interview report identifies that a single fall occurred since the most recent start or resumption of care. The fall is documented on a clinical note from an RN home visit that describes the patient Mr. R's report of a fall that occurred between visits in which he tripped on the dog, fell against the wall, banged his elbow, sustaining a skin tear that he treated himself. Documentation of the RN assessment during the home visit details the healing skin tear and no other injury or symptom identified related to this fall. How will you code J1800, any falls since start or resumption of care? Will you code this as a zero, no fall? Will you code this as a one, yes? How would you answer this question? As before, if you are with a group, discuss this together. Review the information. Jot down what you believe to be the correct answer. And now we're going to move to the next slide and we'll see that the correct answer here is number one, yes. And why do you think that would be? How will we enter the number of falls since, the, since start and resumption of care? We have our three choices, no injury, injury except major, and major injury. Which of these three will you select? In this situation, you're going, to be a, you're going to need to code this for either A, one fall occurred with no injury, in which case you would put a one in A and a zero in B or C. Your next option might be to say zero, no injury, zero injury except major, and one in C for a major injury. Perhaps you think that the injury was B, injury except major. Or perhaps you think that you don't have enough information and you're going to enter a dash for all three options. How will you answer this question? 
It's a little more complicated when you have three options to choose from. You must put a number, either zero or one, in each of the three boxes. So consider the facts of the situation and decide how you will code this. Jot it down. And then we're going to move to the next slide and take a look at what the correct answer is. And we can see here that the green arrow has popped up on C. We've entered a zero for 1900A. We've entered a one under 1900B, injury except major. And we've entered a zero under 1900C. So why did we do that? We chose to enter it that way because in the description, our patient sustained a skin tear. He did not have a major injury, but he did in fact have an injury. So we have entered zero for no injury, one for injury except major, and zero for major injury. In the guidance manual, you will find additional examples and additional information and descriptions that will assist you in doing this correctly. An example, however, might be that if you had found that your patient had sustained both a skin tear and a shoulder joint dislocation as part of the one fall, you would need to code that fall as zero for A, zero for B, and one for C because you only code the fall one time and you code it based on the most serious injury. Let's try another coding scenario. In scenario number four, we are listing here that we would code no injury zero, we would code one for the injury except major because our patient had a skin tear and we would code major injury 1900C as a zero. A laceration is an injury, but it is not major. Let's summarize what we've learned so far about the new elements J1800 and J1900. J1800 and J1900 are not completed at which of the following time points? Transfer, discharge not to an inpatient facility, start or resumption of care, death at home. Which of these do you think it is? When would you not complete this item? The correct answer is start and resumption of care. We have been told, as we began this section, that J1800 and J1900, the number of falls since start or resumption of care, are completed at transfer, discharge not to an inpatient facility, and finally death at home. Let's do another knowledge check. Which example does not meet the definition of a fall? Mrs. T reports losing her balance while going down the stairs, but catching herself on the railing to remain standing. Mrs. B's daughter reports her mother falling while walking to her mailbox. Mr. W reports falling after being pushed by his roommate. All of the above meet the fall definition. Which one of these do you think is the correct answer? If you're with a group, Review each of these items together and jot down your answer. And if everyone's ready, let's move to the next slide and see what the correct answer is. Here, the correct answer is C. The example that does not meet the definition of a fall is when Mr. W reports being pushed by his roommate, causing him to fall. We have already learned that the force exerted on the patient by another outside element is not a fall that we include here. Although Mr. W sustained a fall, it was the result of that overwhelming external force 
his roommate pushing him. Mrs. T had an intercepted fall. If she had not caught herself on the stair railing, she would indeed have fallen. And remember, an intercepted fall is still considered to be a fall. In the highlights of this section, we want to remember J1800 is completed at transfer, discharge, death at home. J1900 is completed at transfer, discharge, death at home. An intercepted fall is a fall. CMS does not consider anticipated loss of balance that occurs during supervised therapeutic intervention as an intercepted fall. There are three levels of fall-related injury, no injury, injury except major, and major injury. That completes our section on Section J, 1800, J, 1900. I'm going to turn the floor over to Charlotte, and she's going to take you through the revised OASIS D assessment elements. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was such a great review of the some of the revisions and the changes, and then, of course, you know, those two new J items, J1800, J1900. So what we're going to do now is take a look at just an overview of these revised items. And in doing so, we're going to identify assessment items that have been revised in the OASIS-D. You've heard of a few of those already, but we're going to take a little bit of a deeper look at those individual items. And then also we're going to summarize the changes to each of the revised assessment items. So this can be a little confusing, so what we've done is actually categorized it a little bit. You'll see that, the cha that there are two um, categories by which we're going to be covering these revisions. The first has to do with the changes to the assessment items and the related guidance. Then we're going to get into the revisions to the guidance manual only, meaning that the items themselves may not have changed, but there may have been some actual changes to the guidance manual, and we'll review some of those items. When we're looking at the seven revised assessment items, we're just going to do a quick review of those, and that's M1028, Active Diagnoses, M1306, Unhealed Pressure Ulcer Injury at Stage 2 or Higher, M1311, The Current Number of Unhealed Pressure Ulcer Injuries at Each Stage, M1322, The Current Number of Stage 1 Pressure Injuries, M1324, the stage of the most problematic unhealed pressure ulcer injury that is stageable, M2102, types and sources of assistance, and M2310, reason for emergent care. You'll see that four of those are having to do with pressure ulcers and injuries, and then of course we have the care management measure of M2102, and then that reason for emergent care, M2310 and we're going to go into a little bit more detail with each of those. When we're looking at the seven revised assessment items, you're going to see that the changes may have occurred in, one of, in some of the following sections. But we're going to take a second to define each of these types of changes. So when you're looking at the time point version, it's important to understand that you might have one time, time point version for one item, at a start of care, and it might look different at a follow-up or at a discharge. When we're talking about the item text, we're talking about the specific language that's used in the item measure. Response options. You'll see that sometimes response options for coding have been added, and sometimes they've been taken away. Kathy reviewed, reviewed a little bit of that earlier. The use of the dash. The use of the dash has been clarified, and CMS has done a good job in understanding you know, that that dash is a valid response, but again, we're going to be looking to have that used on a rare occurrence. And finally, skip patterns. Remember that those skip pattern revisions are really related to some of those items being removed. So when we're looking at guidance manual changes, there have been 33 items that have had the manual changed in one way or another. And even though there are lots of items listed here, we're not going to go over these, we do invite you to take a minute to take a look at your guidance manual 
to see how those changes are reflected. In some of those areas that the changes have been reflected include the item intent, the time points collected, the response-specific instructions. We've provided some additional examples for you to help clarify your understanding of how that measure should be looked at. And then again, data sources and resources. Now, let's do a little deeper dive about those manual changes. So, so a, a good description here, this is kind of an overview of looking at each of these changes, categorizing them, kind of a high-level list of the examples of those changes. So the first thing you'll see listed here is response-specific instructions revised to reflect the one clinician expansion and that collaboration is allowed. This is not a new concept for us that are very familiar with the OASIS, um, that we can actually have an expansion of that one clinician, that collaboration, being able to talk to the physical therapist or the occupational therapist when looking at specific items. You're gonna see that that language has been included. The content associated with deleted items have been removed, and that makes a lot of sense, right? We're not going to see that if, it's, if they're no longer present. And of course, the resulting skip pattern, that language has been revised. There has been some alignment with the new conditions of participation. We all have been working with those conditions of participation over the course of the past year, and it was very important that CMS takes a look at that and see how that's reflected in the OASIS item set. There's been a language alignment across the PAC settings. I think Kathy did a nice job earlier really going into the detail of the purpose of these changes, and really a big one is that alignment across the post-acute care setting. In addition, you're gonna see references to specific Centers for Disease Control Prevention CDC content replaced with just a general statement referring to the CDC. Definitions have been added, and again, this, I think this is a real enhancement to the, to the manual changes because it's important for us all to be on the same page with the way that we're looking at things. There's been a removal of references to process quality measures that are no longer re reported, and again, some minor editorial changes. I do invite you all to consult the OASIS D guidance manual for specific directions and details regarding all of these changes. So let's take a quick knowledge check to see about your understanding of the revisions to the OASIS D. So, the OASIS, um, the revisions to the OASIS D involve which of the following? Would you say changes to the assessment items and related guidance, revisions to the guidance manual only, or both A and B? Take a few seconds. If you have others in the room, consult with them, and let's think about what your response would be. Okay, let's move on and take a look at that, what would be the best response. And you'll see here that both A and B is considered the best response. There were specific changes to the seven assessment items and related guidance. In addition, general revisions to the guidance manual in the areas of item intent, time points collected, response-specific instructions, coding examples, data sources and resources were included in those changes. So now that we've done that, let's take a look at specific item changes. So we did mention there were seven revised assessment items and we did identify them earlier. It's important that we look at some of the major themes for each of the revised items and we did that, but now we want to show you what each of those items will look like with the OASIS D, and we'll highlight those changes for you. Let's start with M1028, active diagnoses. Now, you are all familiar with M1028. This is that standardized assessment item that we had on OASIS C2. What happened, though, is that the response options were revised to align with the other PAC instruments what we did was we added a none of the above response. So the main rationale behind this was that CMS felt that the lack of this option in the OASIS-C2 was kind of challenging for providers. And you can imagine, because if you didn't mark a response like you were intended to do so, if neither applied, 
you would just either not mark it or it could be actually be an omission. So we'd want to be very careful to make sure that it wasn't an omission. And that's the reason why the none of the above response was added. So let's take a look at what that looks like now. You'll notice here on M1028, active diagnoses, the none of the, re none of the above response was added. And just as a reminder, you're completing this at start of care and resumption of care. Let's look at, take a look at M1306 on heel pressure ulcer injury at stage two or higher. We incorporated the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel terminology really to update the alignment with other PAC instruments. And that really revolved around a few things. We replaced excludes healed pressure ulcers with excludes all healed pressure ulcers because mainly that makes sense because all healed stage two pressure ulcers would still be considered you know, healed and we wouldn't include them in this item. So the other real change was adding the words injury, injuries. And really, when we look at the word injury, it is used to refer to a stage one pressure injury and deep tissue injury. The word ulcer is used to refer to stage two, stage three, and stage four pressure ulcers. So let's take a look at what that measure looks like now. Again, you're gonna see the changes highlighted there in yellow. And just as a reminder, we're completing this at start of care, resumption of care, follow up, and discharge. Let's move on to M1311, the current number of unhealed pressure ulcer injuries at each stage. What's important to see here is that the item was retained, but different versions were created for start of care, resumption of care, follow up, and discharge. The start of care resumption of care and discharge information is used to calculate revised pressure ulcer measures. And again, with the goal of alignment with the other PAC instruments, we incorporated the NPUAP terminology updates and modified skip pattern language and direction. Another part of that revision was the use of the dash and identifying that it is a valid response at the discharge time point. It's important, again, to remember that we expect that dash to be a rare occurrence. And again, we use, to stand, we use this to standardize the impact measure. Other changes to M1311 include item text revisions. Adding ulcer injuries were applicable. Adding the word device to the item title in D1, unstageable, non-removable dressing device, and remove suspected in evolution from F1, unstageable deep tissue injury. So now we're gonna take a minute and take a look at all the different versions and all the different changes around M1311. So you'll see here again, with all of the changes highlighted in yellow, this is the start of care resumption to care and follow-up version of M1311. Again, for M1311, this is the discharge version. Now, again, at discharge, you're gonna see a little bit more with the changes reflected here, especially with all of the skip pattern changes. So this is the changes in items A through C for the discharge version and then the item changes for D through F for the discharge version for M1311. So the changes reflected in M1322, current number of stage one pressure injuries, really in this, in this measure, we retain this at start of care and resumption of care and follow up. However, we did remove it from the discharge time point, really because, again, we're looking at that provider burden, and it's not needed for measure calculation. The alignment with other PAC settings, remember, we're trying to make sure that we are collecting the same kind of data at IRF, which is inpatient rehab facility, LTAC, long-term care hospital, and SNF, skilled nursing facility. So within that, goal, we replace the word ulcers with injuries, that NPUAP terminology, 
and we updated the stage one definition. There were no edits to the response options for M1322. So let's take a look at what that one looks like at this point. You'll see with all of those revisions, basically the language of the measure did change. And that's all highlighted there in, in yellow. Again, replacing the word ulcers with injuries and just updating that stage one definition. Remember, we're only completing this at start of care, resumption of care, and at follow up. Changes to M1324, the stage of the most problematic unhealed pressure ulcer injury that is stageable, really dealt with the incorporation of NPUAP terminology updates to align with the pressure ulcer items and other PAC instruments, primarily by adding the word injury. So let's take a look at what that measure looks like now that we've made that one change. You'll see that it, we incorporated that change here in the language of the, of the measure, and then just as a reminder that we're completing it at start of care, resumption of care, follow up, and discharge. So for M2102 types and sources of assistance, you'll see there were different versions of this item that are available for start of care, resumption of care, and discharge. You'll also see that some response options were not essential and were removed to reduce burden. Kathy mentioned that a little earlier in our presentation. So let's take a look at that in a little bit more depth. When we're looking at these changes to M2102, the types and sources of assistance at start of care, resumption of care, you're going to see that the response options were removed for A, ADLs, B, IADLs, C, medication administration, D, medical procedures and treatments, E, management of equipment, and G, advocacy or facilitation of a patient's participation in appropriate medical care. Response F was actually retained at the start of care resumption of care. So when we're looking at OASIS D M2102 types and sources of assistance, we're going to think about how that start of care resumption of care version did change. And you're going to see, like I mentioned, that only F, supervision and safety, was retained. So. When we're looking at changes to M2102 types and sources of assistance for discharge assessment, the response options that were removed were B, IADL, instrument, Instrumental Activities of Daily Living Assistance, E, Management of Equipment, G, Advocacy or Facilitation of a Patient's Participation in Appropriate Medical Care. Response options and the letter sequencing was retained on the discharge assessment for A, ADL, activities of daily living, C, medication administration, D, medical procedures and treatment, and F, supervision and safety. So on the discharge version, just think of it this way. We're actually removed three of the measures and we kept four. So you will still be coding for those four individual items. Changes to M2310, Reason for Emergent Care, is completed on transfer and discharge. And this, I'm sure, is a measure that you are all very familiar with. There used to be, I believe, 20 options for those responses. But now, only four options are needed for calculation of the potentially avoidable event measure. And those were retained. The remaining 15 of those 19 options were not needed for measure calculation and have been removed. These response options were removed to reduce provider burden and CMS does not use these items for measure calculation. And agencies may wish to continue to track these items internally and we invite you to do so. Okay, so changes to that M2310 reasons for emergent care. The response options that we re 
retained, just to go into a little bit more depth, really was that number one, improper medication administration, 10, hypohyperglycemia, diabetes out of control, 19, other than above reason, or the UK, un, the reason being unknown. So then for M13-2310, the reason for emerging care, just as a reminder, we are completing that at transfer and at discharge. So moving on to slide 125, our knowledge check. Which statement regarding M1028 active diagnoses is true? Was a new time point version created? Um, was the best option, the response options have been included, revised to include none of the above, or is it that C, a dash is not a valid response? So let's think about that. So now that we've done, taken a look at that, you met with your team, let's think about that. The best response is B, that response options have been re revised to include none of the above. And again, we did add that to help providers have a response to choose for M1028, remembering, too, that the DASH is a valid response, but we do expect that DASH to be a rare occurrence. Moving on to Knowledge Check 5, the same assessment versions of M1311, and let's remember what M1311 is, that's the current number of unhealed pressure ulcer injuries at each stage, is used for start of care resumption of care, follow-up, and discharge. Is that a true statement or a false statement? What do you think is the correct response? Think about it. Talk about it with your team there. And let's look at the, the correct response. So the answer would be B, false. Remember, M1311 is retained, but different versions were created for the start of care resumption of care, follow-up, and discharge. The start of care resumption of care and discharge assessments are used to calculate the pressure ulcer measure. Let's look at another knowledge check. The best, select the best response for regarding M2102 types and sources of assistance. Is it the response options have been removed to reduce burden? Is it new time point versions have been created for the start of care resumption of care and discharge? Did we retain the letter sequencing for response options? Or would you think all of the above? So again, take a second, think about your answer, meet with your team, let's think about that. Jot your answer down, and let's take a look. So the best response would be D, none of the above. Remembering, response options have been removed to reduce that burden, and this resulted in some new versions created for start of care resumption of care and the discharge time points. Now, just as a reminder, your start of care resumption version only has row F, okay? whereas your discharge version has A, C, D, and F. And that's really evident about that letter sequencing being retained for the rows that we are still gonna be using. So moving on to some additional guidance and clarification. In this section, so we're gonna really explore some areas where guidance was enhanced and clarified. So we're gonna start with looking at the expansion of the One Clinician Convention. And this is, again, going back to the guidance that was related to the One Clinician Convention that was modified back in January of 2018. And this is just to review. While only the assessing clinician is responsible for accurately completing and signing a comprehensive assessment, he or she may collaborate to collect data for all OASIS items if agency policy allows. Now, this is really important, especially when we talked about some of the changes and the new items that we talked about, especially like in the J items, we're looking at falls, and we're going back and we're looking at maybe that, you know, markers coming in. maybe that clinician actually 
um, didn't know of any faults, but their cohort, maybe the dis maybe the physical therapist or occupational therapist, did know about a fall, and they were able to actually look at that and, and answer that item correctly. So modifications in the home care guidance related to the one clinician convention really made based on feedback of the of the home health stakeholders, and I think that that CMS took the time to take a listen to hear that how valuable that is to have you know, that multidisciplinary approach, letting us all look at it um, and, and actually inform that assessment to make it as accurate as possible. And also to better align with the assessment practices in other PAC settings. Remember, a big piece of this is that standardization, making sure that we have the same measures or looking at the measures the same way, and that in the end, we're all using the same intent, definitions, and practices, really, in how we're looking at these measures. So again, just quickly, and if any exception to this general convention concerning collaboration is identified in the item-specific guidance. So we do want you to go back to that specific guidance to ensure that you are looking at that measure correctly. Expansion of the one clinician convention, really when we're looking at this, I do invite you to go back to the guidance. But remember, too, that we do have a Q&A on that as of August 2017 that talked about that. Below on that slide, you're going to see a link to that actual convention. When we're looking at drug regimen review, really there are no big item changes for the drug regimen review in 2019. If you remember, these items were first introduced to home health in 2010 and then revised in 2017. But the reason I really wanted to mention this for you guys is to look at the fact that though we've had drug regimen review for a while now, this, these items are just now being implemented in the ERF, LTAX, and SNF settings for 2018. So just as they're giving us some of their items, we're giving them some as well. So the changes to the drug regimen items for home health in 2019 are really only limited to some guidance refinement to really promote that cross-setting alignment. So let's do another knowledge check and select the best response regarding the one clinician convention. So let's think about that. Would you say that the one clinician convention, is it the comprehensive assessment that includes the OASIS remains the responsibility of the one clinician? Is it the assessing clinician may elicit feedback from other agency staff in order to complete the OASIS? Or would you think that both A and B would be the best way to represent that one clinician convention? So meet with your team. Let's take a look at what we, you know, what you would think. Talk with your team. Maybe jot down your answer. And the best response would be both A and B. Now remembering, the assessing clinician is responsible for accurately completing and signing a comprehensive assessment. However, he or she may collaborate to collect data for all assessment items if the agency policy allows and any exceptions to this general convention concerning the collaboration is identified in item-specific guidance. Okay, so now let's just take a second to, to like highlight some of these changes, these revisions to the OASIS D. Changes to the assessment, the OASIS-D changes really have to do with the changes to the assessment items and the related guidance or revisions to the guidance manual only. Some response options have been removed to reduce provider burden, and you really saw that significant in M2102 and again in 2310. Remember, different time point versions were recreated for some items, and we did actually show you exactly what those items looked like. We also saw where we incorporated the NPUAP terminology updates, and we revised language to align with other PAC settings. Remember, we invite you to consult the OASIS D guidance manual for any specific direction with regard to the revised assessment item. Now that we've taken a look at that, I'm going to turn the floor back over to Kathy, where she's going to give us a nice summary 
of those changes and the, and some resources by which you can better inform yourself with regards to those changes. And Kathy, I'm going to let you take it away. Thank you very much. So we're going to go in and do a summary of the resources that are available to you. We want to identify what things are available to you as you go through and use the new Oasis D. On the Home Health Quality Reporting Program website, from this diagram, you'll be able to see all of the different resources that are available to you. As we mentioned in the very beginning, there is the Spotlight and Announcements section. When we move up around the circle, the next section we come to is the Home Health Quality Measures. This section is going to give you detailed information about the different quality measures that are available to you. There's a section on the Home Health Star Rating System that will break it down, describe for you what's involved, how it's calculated, and what your responsibilities are. The OASIS data sets themselves are available on the website. The user manuals for all of the different OASIS data set tools are here. And I encourage you to go to the website, download those manuals, and use them in your staff education and training. On the QRP website, you also will find the training itself that we are going to, that we've presented here today. You'll also find links to the previous ones and announcements about the ones forthcoming. And lastly, you're going to find your deadlines for your data submission. I want to walk you through what exactly you're going to find on the website. When we begin on the left-hand side of the page, you'll see we have the green box. The Home Health Quality Reporting webpage itself it has two separate sections. The first blue box reminds you that the OASIS, OASIS data sets themselves are here. Above that, you can see the bubble that has the actual hyperlink that will take you right to the data sets. As I said before, the user manuals are also there, and the hyperlink is provided so that you can go directly there. In the downloads, you will find the OASIS D item set in the OASIS data set section, and this is going to be effective, as we said, with 1119. In the user manuals, you will now find the OASIS D guidance manual itself. In that section where the user manuals are, you're going to find the section on with the two appendices in it. Appendix C is the listing of each item, the time points, and the uses. Appendix G is a change table that outlines all the revisions, additions, and removals found in the OASIS D data set. We want to call your attention to another resource that's available to you, the OASIS Educational Coordinators. Each state has a designated OASIS educational coordinator whose responsibility it is to ensure that all providers have access to training in the OASIS data set and how to administer it for assessing your patients. That coordinator is also responsible for training and technical support in integrating the OASIS items in the agency's record keeping system. And third, that coordinator is responsible for providing you technical support in answering questions on the clinical aspects of the OASIS tool. To find your education coordinator for your state, go to the hyperlink in the box at the bottom of your slide. You can click there and you're going to find that you will have a list of the education coordinator for each state. That will enable you to find the contact information and reach out to your education coordinator. 
There are several different help desks. If you have questions about Home Health Quality Reporting Program and the OASIS guidance manuals and you have questions about the content therein, you're going to want to go to the Home Health Quality Help Desk. There is a link there that you can use to access that. If you have questions about the conditions of participation, you want to go to the Home Health Agency Survey Protocols mailbox. And that is listed in the box below. If you have questions about the Home Health Prospective Payment PPS policies, you're going to need to go to the Home Health Policy mailbox. So each of these is a separate location. But these help desks are there for your use, and we strongly encourage you to go ahead and reach out if you have questions in any one of these three areas. There is also a technical help desk. The data submission and certification and survey provider enhancement reports, CASPER, the quality improvement and evaluation system, the KEYS, the Technical Support Office QTSO Help Desk. On this slide, you have a 1-800 phone number, you have an email for help at qtso.com, and you have a website link. I, would, I have personal experience. I want to tell you I have myself reached out by phone and by email to the individuals at the CASPER Help Desk, at the Keys Desk, at the QTSO Help Desk, and I can tell you they are friendly, helpful, and very easy to work with, and very willing to provide you the support you need to access and use your CASPER reports and to get the technical support that you might need. When you're working with the Help Desk, it's very important that you remember HIPAA must take priority. Please do not send any identifiable patient information through an email. This includes medical record numbers, dates of birth, service dates, including visit dates, admission dates, or discharge dates. Any other data elements that might be considered a patient identifier or protected health information must not be sent through an email when you are working with the help desk. As we said, as Sharon said at the beginning of this program, proposed rules and final rules come out on a regular basis. They are published in the Federal Register and are typically released each year in July and again in November. There is a web link here where you will find proposed and final rules posted on this web page. If you have questions, if you would like to read or review any proposed or final rule on any topic, please go to this web link. It is there for your use and it is important that we, you utilize the resources provided to you. There is one more resource that I cannot stress enough. The Medicare Learning Network is critically important. Whenever Charlotte and I work with providers, we teach them to make the Medicare Learning Network a favorite link in their favorites or right on their desktop on their computer. At the Medicare Learning Network, you're going to find educational materials for healthcare professionals of every discipline on CMS programs, policies, and different initiatives. If you go to the Medicare Learning Network site and become a subscriber, you'll receive the weekly email newsletter here in the newsletter, you're going to find a wide variety of different sources of information. But on the Medicare Learning Network as well, you're going to find educational programs, videos, training materials. It's an excellent way to utilize free materials to keep yourself and your clinicians current.
current, up-to-date, and compliant with how we need to practice. I want to also remind you about the Home Health, Hospice, and Durable Medical Equipment Open Door Forum. These are held on a regular basis, and they address the concerns of each of these three unique healthcare areas within the Medicare and Medicaid program system. Issues related to home health PPS, to the new competitive bidding for durable medical equipment, and the Medicare hospice benefit are all topics that the forum has covered. There is a web link here where you can go and you can find the dates for open door forums that are coming. You'll find the topics for forums that have been held already and for forums that are coming. And you can also subscribe to the email newsletter with additional information and dates and other pieces of information you will need. At the beginning of our program, we talked about the different Oasis D training opportunities. I want to remind you, today's webinar has been recorded and it will shortly be posted on the CMS website for your use. On September the 5th, we will be having a second webinar, and during that program, we will be going through the Oasis D section GG in great detail. This is a program that you will not want to miss. At some point in October and November of 2018, there will be a question and answer teleconference scheduled. So watch the spotlight announcements for that day and time. And lastly, but not least, sometime late October, early November of 2018, there will be an in-person home health provider training in Baltimore, Maryland, and a webcast will be available of that program. So again, watch the spotlight announcements for that date so that you can register timely and not get closed out. As I just mentioned to you, the spotlight and the announcements is where you will go using this web link so that you will always have the most current information for the dates and times of important programs on the quality initiatives, the different instruments and tools that you need. For training, you will use the web link in the lower box with the purple banner so that you'll always know when and where and how to access all of the training initiatives. And that is going to bring us, finally, to a summary of what we've talked about today. OASIS D is going to be implemented with all assessments that have a MU 90 date assessment completed of January 1st, 2019 or later. The changes to the new OASIS D include new standardized patient assessment data elements, an alignment in the content of items that support cross-setting measures so that some measures were somewhat revised. Comprehensive item use evaluation resulting in the reduction of burden to the provider and some quality measure changes resulting in item use removal. Lastly, there were updates and corrections to the guidance manual. And as we said before, we are strongly encouraging you to utilize the guidance manual. Make sure that you go through there and you educate and train your assessment staff in any changes that have been made in the guidance manual. And that brings us to the end of our program today. I want to thank you for attending. Questions that have been submitted during today's webinar will be carefully reviewed. Answers will be provided in the near future on the CMS Home Health Quality Reporting Program website. In addition, the questions that you have submitted will also be addressed at an upcoming teleconference scheduled for sometime in late October, November 2018. So please make sure to monitor the spotlight and announcements for that day and time. 
and I'm going to turn the program back over to Sharon today. Thank you so much. Um, this has been a wonderful webinar. Um, but before we wrap up today's event, um, I want to thank Kathy and Charlotte for their valuable knowledge that was shared throughout today's webinar. This actually concludes the introduction of the Oasis D webinar. And I also wanted to let you know that the full version of the slides, the questions and answers, as well as the recorded, recorded version of this webinar will be posted and you will receive an email notifying you when and where those items have been posted. Thank you very much for, for attending today's webinar and enjoy the rest of your day. Have a good day. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you all for attending.